So I actually, my weakness in this group is actually diversity and partly education, which is a little bit ironic. Um, so I started at Stanford as a research scientist. I'm in computational material science. I actually do both electronics and some geoscience projects and some energy projects, kind of across the board. Um, about three and a half years ago, my soft money ran out and the dean hired me as part of our um, High Performance Computing Center at Stanford to, to be in charge of educational outreach and put together a graduate program in computational geoscience. So my experience has been hands-on. Um, and actually, I'm really excited to be here because this is the first opportunity I've had to kind of think about some of these issues with diversity besides my own narrative and also to, to understand education a little bit and even these ideas of assessment. I heard my first you know, thoughts about assessment a year and a half ago. Um, so to tell you a little bit where the program is just before I start is we just had our first graduate students, a set of graduate students graduate in June. We have our third set just accepted and so we're a very small program. We um, have about seven students now, but I feel like this is a really good time to talk to this community um, and maybe for both directions, um, listening to this past discussion, and just getting your advice on how, you know, moving forward, how to incorporate diversity into this program um, and what we can do. And I'll give you some of the challenges I'm facing. So first, I have to figure out how to advance this, okay. So first I'll talk to you a little bit about who we are or who I am in terms of this computational geoscience program. Um, and then I work for this center, which is the Center for Computational Earth and Environmental Systems, CEASE. And I'll talk to you a little bit about our mission and goals. And then I'll talk about, um, whoops, CompGeo, the curriculum development, and then, like I said, some challenges and, and what I see as working solutions um, for some of the problems facing. So who we are, this is kind of me. We're actually a very small organization. We have two directors. Me, I'm in charge of education. We have somebody who's, who's a computational research guru. And then we have a system admin. So there's only five of us. We're a very small program. Um, but we support all of the computation that's done in the School of Earth Sciences. And we have, which is approximately half of, of who we have work with. The CompGeo program has been set up in a collabor close collaboration with the School of Engineering as well um, through the Institute of Computational Mathematical Engineering. The director of this is Professor Margot Gerritsen, um, who actually is also a professor of energy resources engineering in the School of Earth Sciences. So we're a very close-knit group. Um, and that's, that's how we kind of got started with this program. So this is, I guess it's cut off a little bit. Okay, so. Um, in terms of CEASE, who we are, so our goal really is to expand the School of Earth Sciences computational com capacity for analyzing, simulating, and predicting the behavior of complex earth processes and systems. So really what we want to do is make computational accessible for everybody in the School of Earth Sciences who is even remotely interested in using it. Um, so what we want to do is grow the computational earth sciences. What ends up happening is because earth sciences has so much, so many different types of computing, whether it's data, algorithmics, um, just providing um, processors for codes for large um, parallel um, systems. So we have a lot to do in terms of the different computing resources. Um, and also education. And it's amazing for me how key education is in computational geoscience. So I was from, I was, grew up in the electronics industry or education system. And in electronics, everybody from undergraduate up knew how to use a computer. They knew what Linux system, what part of it is, it's a little bit older, but they knew what a Linux system was. They knew, they liked computers. Or sciences, you get a lot of people who have never done anything besides, you know, play games or, or this sort of thing. So in terms of scientific computing, it's completely new. At the same time, our computer science departments don't teach basic computer science anymore. They teach cutting edge computer science. So trying to get students educated in high performance computing 
is extremely challenging for us. And I'll talk more about that. And so part of our, our goal is to really serve also as an intellectual hub. So to, to bring different groups together and so students can help collaborate and, and teach each other and, and find online resources and things like that. So these are our kind of areas of research that we support our systems, which is kind of our climate area. So how we um, how climate impacts society is also within there. Um, and then resources, we put it under resources. Most of our resources is oil and gas, but this is a nicer marketing. Um, and it includes also energy, energy systems, which we're moving towards in um, the the Energy Resources Engineering Department. And then we also do research on hazards, so earthquakes and volcanoes, um, some work on tsunamis and things like that. This is how our um, cluster is essentially utilized. Res resources represents about half of what we use, and then a quarter for both um, climate and hazards. And as I said, we support about 210 users we're, one thing that I haven't mentioned is we're actually a fully shared facility. And so what that means is our faculty buy in. We also have some buy in for the dean. We all pull our money together to buy nodes. We each get priority on whatever nodes that we purchased. But then when they're not being used, other users can come in and use it. So that provides, um, well, first, it's much more efficient because we don't have the computer just sitting there thinking and not doing anything. Um, and also, it allows us to let other um, people in who aren't traditionally computational people, they can get in and, and use the cluster. Um, we update our cluster every year and a half or so. We take our old cluster and we open up in, to the entire School of Earth Sciences. So the newest cluster is used just for those who purchase, and then um, the older clusters are for everybody. And um, so the number of groups is approximately 20. And like I said, we support about half the School of Earth Sciences with that. So this is kind of what my job description is. Um, I'm in charge of their educational outreach. So what I do is um, look at organizing computationally focused workshops and short courses, trying to bring faculty together on, on common themes of what, um, especially our young faculty, um, and reaching out to communities, national labs, things like that, build collaborations. I'm also in charge of a computational geoscience seminar program um, where we bring in people from industry, other institutions, some of our own, and expose our um, primarily graduate students to different research topics and, and connect them with other um, groups as well. And then the big one was setting up the graduate program in computational geoscience, which is what I'll talk mostly about for the remainder of the time. So this is um, the program. I have flyers out there if you haven't seen them already. Um, so CompGeo, we had some ideas at the beginning whether we we're going to sell it as a PhD program, a master's program. What we decided to do is to kind of take advantage of this um, institute that we have, ICME, um, which already is heavily computational mathematical program. And the goal of that program is really to interact with all the different disciplines in the university that are computational and kind of provide their computational component. Um, so we're housed in that department. And our, our, our primary idea is that when people in the School of Earth Sciences or when faculty get students, they tend not to have the computational and or the mathematical background. And so this was a way to provide those students kind of the training that they will need to succeed in very heavy HPC-centered research projects. So students are um, go through this 45-unit master's program. And then they can use those units, apply to graduate school, get into the, hopefully get into the PhD program in the School of Earth Sciences, apply those credits towards their PhD, and continue on. Um, and one thing I'll talk a little bit more about later is part of this is since we have such a small program, we, we meet each student and we pair them with a the faculty when they're accepted. They're fully funded with RAs, so they have their research project coming in. We pair them with their faculty and hopefully they continue on and work with that faculty. Um, 
So our aim is to attract both earth science students who want to develop expertise in computational research and also um, people who are already in computational science who are looking for an application. In reality, we tend to be heavier on the former or the la latter versus the former. Because of our program, some of the courses coming in are, cha are too challenging for students who have not had the right math program. And I'll talk about that in terms of my challenges. Um, and then we also allowed for, so um, the main program is a five quarter program. We also designed it so that one could take it as a three quarter program to kind of attract industry um, as well. I should say a three quarter program, you have to be a rock star to be able to survive that but it's there for those who want to. So as I said, all of our students are on RAs. So, they, so we give them funding as they come in, and our funding comes from the School of Earth Sciences, and then we also have funding uh, fellowships from both Schlumberger and um, Shell. But now I'll talk about our curriculum. Um, so we really wanted you know, to, to pair these, or to combine these three aspects, or sciences, applied math and numerical analysis, and computer science. So this is our approach to doing that. Um, our modern programming methods for science and engineering pair, uh, couples the earth sciences and computer science. Applied mathematics, um, with an emphasis on numerical methods, pairs our earth sciences and applied math. Algorithms and architectures for HPC is kind of our computer science and applied math. And then our computationally oriented earth science courses kind of bring it all together. So I'll go through this fast. These are kind of our essentially requirements. We have six main requirements. The first one is foundational. This is our math component. And this is really the most challenging for everybody coming in and um, represents the barrier in terms of admission for students coming into the program. So students are required to take four, four of these classes they have to be within two of the disciplines. And they focus mainly on what their research project is going to be. The second one is the computational geoscience classes. So we have these areas that are representative for faculty in our department who teach something in computation and earth sciences. This again is a bit challenging um, because it really depends, trying to force a faculty to teach a computational or science course is impossible. So it's, it's a bit challenging, um, again, to, to, to make sure these are taught in such a way that students coming in in that area are going to be able to fulfill their requirements. Um, and I'll talk about how we overcome that a little bit later, too. Um, like I said, they have a research project, so they're required to do research. So one of the things that we felt was really important is to make sure our students also have some time to spend on writing. Because writing is such a crucial part of communicating your ideas to the outside world. And so we have this research component requires that um, they either, um, well, the default one is a written report. So if nothing else happens, they do this project, they don't find anything stellar, but they've done a good job, they can just write a report. Um, optimally, what would be fantastic is if they all got a publication out of it. So that clearly um, satisfies that. Or if they are accepted to some national, international conference where they give a talk and they have to write an extended abstract, um, we accept that as well. Four, programming, which actually is not that big of a component. So it's only um, one to two classes, but it has to be at a level of HPC. So it's not just basic programming. They have to at least do um, the parallel programming. As I said, we also, I run this seminar. Seminar is also part of their requirements for this. Um, just to show you, we have students. These are our three students who just graduated um, this fall. So Hui wrote, just to give you an idea of the diversity of projects, um, he did a, a, a project on simulating um, or writing a code for a very sophisticated way to solve the wave equation for seismic imaging. Um, and he is continuing on to his PhD. Gabe wrote a solver for modeling tsunamis. Um, and then Cyril wrote an um, uh, algorithm to, that would work on a GPU cluster. 
and he was actually on loan from Total, and he went back um, to, to Total in France for, to finish his job. Um, so I don't have much time left, but um, I just want to kind of briefly go um, summarize the challenges a little bit. So as I said, these foundational math courses are really the barrier to admission. So the first thing I do is when a student contacts me and says, I like your program, I have to ask them, what level of math have you gone through? Because they won't survive the curriculum if they don't have the correct um, program. Students also have to, within this model, they have to have a clear idea what they want to do. There's not enough time for them to decide. So they need to have had some kind of experience and know what, at least what discipline they want to be in. Um, and then the, the number or the types of computational courses. And I, um, the biggest one for me is teaching HPC. This is the hardest thing that we have to do. And then also, I'm now putting on a new hat, which is um, recruitment and marketing and advertising in this part of the program, which I personally find challenging because I, it's my new, my new skill set. Um, so working solutions for the mathematical courses. We do have an, a, a mini boot camp, but this is for students who are already accepted. So it doesn't help with the barrier, but if they've had those courses before, there is a chance that they're not going to have them at the level that they're taught here. And so we do have a refresher course so that at least going in, it's a little easier. Um, the research projects. So this computational geoscience seminar, I try and advertise to our undergraduate students. They're open to everybody, so perhaps this would help. But it only helps our students at Stanford who want to go on to the program. Um, undergraduate research experience, I put this in, in italics because I don't have any control or can't really help anybody with that. Um, diversity of courses. So one of the what we do now is we allow non-computational courses and non-geoscience courses if it's demonstrated that they're useful for whatever research project that they have. So teaching HPC. So what I mean by HPC is teaching all of this. And so this is kind of what we're working on now. How can we teach all of this? And we don't need to teach all of it to all students. So that makes it even more challenging because we can't have one course that all students take. One, it would be probably a five-quarter class to begin with. So how do we teach this? Um, a lot of it is done self-study. So this is what one of the things that they do mostly when they're doing their research project, is trying to learn this. And that's one of the roles that CIS plays, is helping these students one-on-one, -on -one, teaching them how to write their Python script to submit jobs, teaching them how to effectively um, use the cluster. Um, we're also looking in, or we also have short courses available within ICME. There are just three-week courses, intensive on some area. So say OpenMP, they'll have a three-week course where students can take that. Um, and one of the things we're discussing now is online learning. So not in the framework of MOOCs, but in the framework of JOLTS, which was developed at Stanford at Stanford Just-in-Time Online Learning Tools. And the idea of this is that these are not as long. So these would only represent, say, an hour of lecture. And the idea would be to kind of flip the classes. So we, we teach a lecture, and this was actually done by Damien um, Rousson, who, who was part of CIS just recently, decided that he wanted to go um, back into his um, own company, but he still teaches for us. And so the idea is you record it once for a lecture, and then you continually reuse that, and then during the class, you use as a hands-on computer lab. So that takes less, or it takes the work away from the faculty a little bit more, and can be staffed by staff and, and postdocs. And then I just, well, I'm not going to talk about that because we're almost done. But um, So the other one that, that I kind of have poses more of a question to, to this audience is, um, you know, thinking about recruitment in terms of um, underrepresented students. So this is kind of my, my list of what, I, what we do now in terms of recruitment. But how can we open this up um, and think more broadly about it? So, you know, going to recruitment fairs, conferences, um, publishing, you know, advertising in publications, talking about our program. Um, 
I also am involved with a summer undergraduate research program, which I'll talk about in a minute, called SURGE, um, which is actually for underrepresented students. Another thing, you know, we don't have a Facebook site. We don't Twitter. We're all kind of old in our group and oldish. And so thinking about, actually, I have a high school student who's working with me this summer, and I'm, she may help with that a bit. Um, and then also just spam, emailing, mailing everybody I know who's in computational geoscience, which you guys will, may all get an email from me. Um, and then uh, actually most of how we get our students right now is individual recruitment. So students come in to and apply to the School of Earth Sciences because that everybody knows the School of Earth Sciences already. And then we say, hey, are you interested in computational geoscience because we have these great fellowships and it's a new program. So that's kind of where we are. I want to mention Surge a little bit. It's not, um, I was involved with it last summer. This summer, none of the students picked me as my research project. But that's OK, maybe next year. Um, Surge was actually started um, by Jerry Harris. Some of you may know. He's the um, Dean for Multicultural Affairs. And he actually started CIS. He was the person who I hired me. I, and he, it was his idea, actually, to start this computational geoscience program. So I, he hired me. I went into his office, and he put this stack of papers down and said, here, why don't you do that? <laughs> um, so what this program is, is it's an eight-week summer program. Stu students from um, American universities, but from underrepresented groups, are, um, are paired with faculty and mentors. And we have several levels of mentors. So they have a faculty mentor, and then, which can be the same or different than their research mentor. And then they also go through these symposiums. Um, where is it? Workshops. So they go through workshops each week where um, they go through um, help with preparing for their GRE, applying for graduate school, understanding geoscience and engineering careers in general, um, et cetera, et cetera. So my student I had last year, he actually did a fantastic job. He came in um, with just a general earth science background. And he did a very interesting project on modeling, um, modeling the interaction of CO2 with coal in order to look at sequestration processes using ab initio quantum chemistry software, which is extremely challenging. And he did a fantastic job, and he made it look so easy. And at the end, he sent me an email and said, that was the most intensive, stressful thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> so we're actually trying to recruit him. I should say he's from Mexico City. And we're, we're trying to recruit him. He's in his senior year now, and we're trying to recruit him to be able to come for junior for the next year. Um, so I'm going to leave you kind of with my challenges. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, to keep us on time, we only have probably time for about one question, depending on the length of the answer in the question. Anybody? You don't have to do it all. Teaching HPC, there's so much out there through Exceed. Talk to me. OK, I will. So one thought, this is great. I'm excited to see it. One thought is about challenges and language. And part of what I saw here, those foundational courses that you see posing a barrier are really there to enable students to do those other things that are more synthetic. Don't call them barriers. They're not barriers. And then make sure as you implement them that they are not barriers. So that if students, you have the wonderful or day. So this is one of my right? challenges right. because I don't have control over those classes. Understood. Yeah. But it's a thought yeah. pattern. Yeah. And then you can infect others. So if those courses are courses where people have problems, then try to figure out if there's a course sequence so that they can retake them while not stopping the rest of the program. But try to find pathways so that they're not barriers, but they're simply supporting. This is great. Along the vein of support, I'm, I, I was thinking um, how invested is um, your program in making sure that there are adequately prepared um, minorities or underrepresented populations coming in. Um, I know that you have surge, but do you have, um, have you ever tried to 
work backwards to see where do we need to get students who are applying to our program at what level and then you know doing the reverse seminars at minority serving institutions something like that yeah so where we are right now in some sense which is why I think it's important to start thinking about it now we are just trying to get any applicants in some sense but because we just we're so new we're not finding even enough capacity across the board so And this is the last strategy, and it's really easy and really cheap, and that is start giving an award at the local science fair for anything in computational geoscience. It starts raising awareness of the kids at the middle and high school level that it even exists. That's a good idea, and it's yeah. amazing how quickly you'll see an increase in the number of students who are doing things at the high school level because they know that there's an award there. It doesn't have to be money. It can be a tour. Yeah. And, and we do that with the Wyoming Science Fair, just for example. So because we got to eat at the cork at the same table, I know a little bit more about you. And would you please share with this audience some of your early college career track? Where did you go to school to begin with? Uh, my, so my, my diversity narrative. So I'll add a little bit more than I did at the table. So I was essentially one of these flower children from Berkeley. My mom quit college and joined a commune in Berkeley. And I grew up there. She moved when I was seven. We moved to the backwoods of Vermont, out in a cabin, no electricity, running water, survival. <laughs> um, then we moved back to Oregon in high school, which as a 14-year-old girl, I can tell you that showers are fantastic. <laughs> um, when, so when I graduated high school, I was always very good in science and math. Um, and I always knew I wanted to go to college. I don't know why. I always knew I wanted to go to college. And actually, I wanted to go to Berkeley. I didn't know how to fill out the applications. I ordered, I sent for them, um, got them in the mail, had no idea how to fill them out. Um, so then I applied to the local community college. And I went to Rogue Community College for two years and then, or a year and a half, the math classes ran out. And so I decided my, I was the only physics um, major in the school. And so the physics teacher loved me. And he helped me apply to graduate school and, or an undergraduate four year school, Oregon State. And that started off. That's my little diversity narrative. 